Welcome everyone to the Termis SYS Europe uh, interviews with the scientists. We, uh, with these interviews, we want to briefly portray the variety of profiles of young scientists in the Termis community. Today we have John Dawson. Uh, hey John, could you please first inter um, introduce yourself a little bit? Sure, hello everyone. Um, really nice to be chatting to you all. So my name is John Dawson, I'm a Associate Research Professor, so Principal Investigator in the University of Southampton, um, where I'm also an EPSRC Research Fellow. Um, and my research area is in regenerative medicine, and I'm specifically interested in um, nanoparticles, and even more specifically in clay nanoparticles and their interesting utility for delivering stem cells and biological molecules for the purpose of regenerative medicine. Thanks, Sean. And um, we want to know a bit more about your um, PI life. How are you managing your group, um, especially during these difficult times? Are you, uh, I imagine um, you're interacting with them through, of course, um, any source of media or Zoom or Teams or other means. Um, are you using other sorts of managing tools, calendars or other things that other people around uh, could get an interest of? Yeah, so nothing particularly high-tech. Um, it's been difficult. The way I like to manage a group is by basically being around, uh, being available to have people to come into my office and chat to me, uh, wandering the labs when I'm bored and just seeing how people are getting on. Uh, and so I've really, really missed that. Um, I use, we use Teams. We have a weekly uh, meeting first thing on a Monday morning. And that's normally good. Generally, we try to make it quite chatty. We, um, everyone gets a chance to talk about what they've done the previous week, what they're planning to do this week, um, share people's problems and issues and challenges. And then um, normally um, one person takes it in turns to do a kind of deep dive into to their area. Uh, originally, I was trying to keep them more informal. Um, and I said, if you want to bring along presentations and stuff to share, you're welcome to. Uh, but no one ever brought anything. So I've been forced a, um, a schedule where one person a week has to, to present. And that generally works really well. Um, what tends to happen is when um, you, you're kind of just doing the nitty gritty each week, it's quite easy to lose sight of the big picture. And so having the chance to hear from one person in a bit more depth each week allows everyone to understand a bit more of the context of what they're doing on a weekly basis. So we find that works well. Um, but apart from that, um, no, we, I, I don't use anything particularly high tech. Um, we don't have any shared, um, uh, I, know, I know there are, there are different things out there which we've not yet really explored. Just before lockdown, um, we were beginning to look at using a lab management software for ordering reagents, keeping track of stock. Um, and that looks really promising. So far, it's been a bit slow for people to take it up, but I'm hoping that might work out and help us in the long term. So now that you talked a bit about the lockdown, how, of course, it's, it's uh, affected us in a lot of different ways, but is there anything that you can point out, maybe a positive and a negative, as in something that you think has improved? or like has made you better, maybe more reflective since you have less time in the lab, for example? And yeah, something that obviously is wrong. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think for me, uh, well, I think for everyone, we've all realized that you can do an awful lot actually over Teams. So whereas probably for this kind of interview in the past, we'd have, I'd have traveled to Maastricht or, or Italy we've now realized we can do it uh, very easily, uh, fit it into an hour in the afternoon. Uh, and I'm sure that's gonna have implications um, going forward. It probably means we're able to pack more of these kind of meetings in. I think just that realization that there's so much you can do over online, um, it's a big deal. It's a bit sad. I'd obviously prefer to be in Maastricht or Rome. <laughs> <laughs> but still, at least we could have this conversation and, and talk quite in depth, really. And we've I've had loads of research meetings and, and that kind of thing. Um, we've had 
I mean, during the times where the lab's shut, we've been doing busying ourselves with other activities. We got a new website up and running, so that was a big plus. And I bet that wouldn't have happened uh, really if um, if we didn't have have the, the kind of enforced stoppage of, of lab activity. Uh, so I think probably that has been the big bonus, really. Um, and that's had a, a big impact on the group already. It's great to have a nice forum where we can show off all of our research, uh, um, kind of articulate a little bit about the culture of the group. Um, so when I get a students inquiring about working with me, it's very easy to, um, to, to send people a link to the website and they've, they, they they could very quickly get a sense of what we do and what we're about as a group. So that's definitely something I'm really pleased to have um, coming out of that. And I should credit uh, Roxana uh, Ramnarine Sanchez, who put a lot of work into that during lockdown. Nice. Thank, thanks, John. Um, can you tell us about your academic experience? Uh, what have you done for your PhD? Where and what about your postdoc? And, um, and also, I'll, I'll add another question. Uh, do you believe a large group, more than 30 people, is uh, useful or is really nice for the first postdoc or for a PhD? Or is it better a smaller group uh, with less mm -hmm. people around? Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks, Angelica. They're good questions. So tell you a bit about my career, first of all. So I'm a um, um, biologist by training. I did an undergraduate at Plymouth University in the southwest of England. I then moved to Southampton University for my PhD. I followed that up with a postdoc at Southampton University and then another postdoc at Southampton University and then a subsequent postdoc at Southampton University. And then I undertook a fellowship at Southampton University. <laughs> so I think I've got an unusual career path. Um, I know many of my colleagues and peers have moved around to different groups. Um, for me personally, there was a few factors in, in, that in those decisions really. Partly, um, I'm, I'm married, my wife's got a, a job. Um, she was also for a while working um, contractual work, not in, not in science. Um, and so there was a period of our life where we were both kind of going through postdoc contracts or her, her research, char her, her charity contracts. And the end points of those contracts never aligned. So we're always looking for more work in Southampton. Um, but at the same time, I found myself in a really, really um, productive group. Um, I worked throughout my career with Richard Arefo, and that's been a really significant and beneficial uh, relationship for me. It doesn't work with all PIs, but Richard was someone who um, invested a lot in me as an individual, gave me more and more responsibility, helped me um, start thinking about developing my own research area, gave me space to carve out my own research direction, um, and then um, encouraged me to think about applying for fellowships and, and my, own, my own sources of funding. Um, and so because of that, I think that was really a major part in getting me where I am because it meant I could first of all invest in one particular research project and really take it quite a long way. Um, we've now, we're now at the stage where we've got a spin-out company, we're trying to um, translate it into, translate a series of technologies all based on this one core idea of nanoclay particles through into the clinic. Um, and as you know, doing that takes a long time generally to take um, a technology from the lab to the clinic, especially if it's a drug-based technology, takes 10, 15, 20 years, 100 million pounds of investment to get it all the way through. Um, it's a career's worth of work. Uh, and so being able to take what I started in my PhD all the way through was really only possible, I think, because I've stayed in the same place. So um, I recognise there are limitations. And one of the things that I've had to push myself to do throughout my career is um, send myself into new research areas, work with new collaborators. So I'm stretched in that way. Um, but the good thing is, is that, that it allows you to invest um, for a long period of time in one particular area and, and really see it develop. 
Um, and really, and I think that's reflected in my various uh, fellowship um, uh, funding applications, which were successful. They, they recognised that I was presenting mature ideas with proven track record and potential, um, and therefore they were they were kind of exciting, but but also um, well tested ideas to to invest in. Um, you asked about group size, uh, and I think that's that's a good question um, because there is definitely uh, advantages from working in small groups and advantages from working in big groups. Um, Richards uh, had quite big groups. So that's that's what I was in as a postdoc, um, and the good thing about that is it exposes you to different people, obviously, but also generally allows you to take realms of responsibility um, that, that maybe you wouldn't get in a much smaller, tighter packed group. Um, my research group at the moment is uh, six, seven, eight people. And I really, I like working with that size. I feel like I know what everyone's doing. Um, there's a real core um, a kind of united focus to what we're doing. Um, there's enough, um, there's not too many people, so we can really talk to each other on a week to week basis about what everyone's up to. And I think there's real benefits in that. Um, probably my other experience of being involved in a big group was in my last postdoc where um, I was part of a consortia, uh, one of these big framework seven European cross institution consortia grants. And that was really significant for me because it meant I could interact very directly with a whole load of different groups. Um, again, I was able to not just fulfill my particular project roles as a postdoc in that, but also bring my own um, research that I'd been developing with these nanoclay particles into that consortium and benefit from collaborations through that as well. So um, having exposure to lots of different people, lots of different places with different backgrounds in a really multidisciplinary environment, I think is really, really helpful as you're developing as a postdoc, especially if you're given that freedom to develop your own collaborations and links. Sorry, that was a long answer. You did combine Long, very some questions though. So. Very insightful. So um, I guess a good uh, positive thing <laughs> for people who might be a bit scared of like moving, like do they have to move too much around to be successful? I think you're a good example of like, it might seem like the norm that you have to travel, but it also, there's good examples of a uh, success um, mm -hmm. regardless of staying in one specific place. Um, another question we had was how do you, uh, and disseminate your work as in like um, all what you do through your research or your research group do you share of course via papers but do you do any outreach activities or how do you make sure that the public gets to know what you're working on yeah thanks um so that's been something that i've really enjoyed thinking about and um i think my own research has benefited from being quite active in public engagement. Um, I've, I have enjoy communication generally. So I like giving talks, kind of public talks. We have this thing in the UK called Point of Science where um, people hire out pub spaces and invite a load of scientists just to talk about their research. I love that kind of thing. Um, and both to listen to others and also have a go at it myself. Um, Probably the most successful thing we've done in this area is we, we, during, for my first fellowship, I was given a load of money to develop an exhibit on stem cells. And we had the idea of basically taking um, Waddington's landscape model of um, stem cell differentiation very, very literally. You've probably seen that image of a, a marble rolling, a boulder rolling down a landscape and the, the different contours of the landscape determine the, um, the, the, the differentiation potential of the stem cell. Uh, so we, we kind of use that as an idea to make this massive marble run we, we called the stem cell mountain. Um, we did this with a um, local science museum in, um, just up the road from us in Winchester. 
And there they've, they've got a really talented team of people whose job it is to design these kind of exhibits. So we worked with them and we had loads of fun, actually. It was really good. And we, um, it, it, there was a really creative guy there called Ben Ward, and he managed to find this guy who, from California whose job it is to make marble runs. And so we had this kind of giant corkscrew type thing coming out from the middle, which then fed marbles into the top of this Waddington's landscape model all the way around, them, around the edge or 360 degrees around the mountain. There was lots of different cell types that the marbles could, could end up in. Um, it was really fun and it looked really cool. And we took it to loads of different um, science centers and festivals around the UK. Um, in fact, and, and we still do. So that's quite a core part of our, our research engagement. Uh, and I think it's good because basically it provides a really nice launch pad for talking about what we're doing. People are attracted to the marble run, kids jump all over it and uh, play with it. But then you get to chat to them and explain our research and use the, the, the model as an illustration of some of the points you're making. Um, so we've had loads of really helpful and interesting conversations about, about the science we do. And the benefit of that, I think, is first of all, during a PhD, you can often lose sight of why your research is interesting or important. Um, and there's no better antidote for that, I think, than actually talking to people about what you're doing and seeing their reaction and hearing them say, well, that's really interesting or that's really important. Um, maybe talking about their own health experiences and why, um, why they think this kind of research is important. So it's really inspirational for researchers. Um, and there's also been loads of serendipitous encounters I've had uh, people working in different areas who've had ideas about what we're doing. I've recruited PhD students from alongside the, um, the stem cell mountain as well. So there's all kinds of things that come out just by really putting yourself out there and talking about what you're doing, things you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. Um, but I, so I'm, I'm, I think it's a really, really important thing to do. Um, and, and of course, as publicly funded researchers as well, I think we have a a responsibility to be open and transparent and share the, the, the joy of what, we're, what we have the privilege to do as researchers. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure lots of people will find it um, helpful and interesting. Um, I would like to know about your first grant ever, your first fellowship. Mm. Um, what was it about? How did you get it in a sense of how much time did you spend on it? Mm. Was it difficult? And if you can uh, share tips and tricks for next postdocs that will attempt your same fellowship or other type of fellowship or grants. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually my very first grant was a small, um, we call them pump prime grants. Uh, in Southampton, uh, in the south coast of England, there's a, um, a research charity called Wessex Medical Research. And they fund small projects, basically give you little bits of money just to get something started really with the aim of generating um, proof of concept for a larger grant application uh, and so I I put in a, a grant to them based on some of my PhD research and, and my first or second postdoc and so that was my first bit of funding and then that allowed me to um, just um, carve out a little bit of my own time it didn't actually fund my wage but um, again, I've been in a supportive environment and develop a, a kind of some early proof of concept for a paper and, and then my subsequent applications. That was really, really helpful. It just shows that you've got the capability to win funding um, and manage, manage a small pot of money and, and bring something out of often quite small amounts of money. All of those things I think are really significant when you come to writing your first applications. Um, I applied for two or three fellowships before I got um, the PSRC fellowship I won. Um, and um, they, it wasn't so much a process of learning from my failures because I was, I basically submitted similar grants to various people. Um, but I had um, reasonably good scores from the EPSRC and got an interview. Um, and, and, and was able and was successful for a five-year fellowship from EPSRC for that. Um, in terms of what helped me, I think 
probably the best advice I got was really just to see writing grants as telling a story. Um, and with a fellowship application, you're telling two stories. You're telling the story of your, your research, first of all. Um, so all stories start with a, um, a problem um, or an idea and then a problem and then um, a solution to that problem and how you're going to do it and that kind of thing. So getting a really strong narrative of what your idea is, why it matters, how you're going to do it and why you think it's going to be successful. Um, but for a fellowship, you need to have two stories because you need to have your research story, but also your own personal story. And um, you tell that story as well, how you've developed as a researcher, how you got interested in this area, the successes you've had um, and why, you're, why you think this is a good idea. And really for a successful application for a fellowship, the two stories need to mesh really well because your job is to show why this idea is good and why you're the person who, who is who's going to take this idea forward and, and why it's you and your particular background and your particular um, uh, all, the, all the things you've done so far in your career, why that's brought you to this point and why you think you can take this idea forward particularly. Um, and I, I found that a really, really helpful model just for thinking about these, these applications, which tend to be reasonably equally balanced between the research idea and the, the strength of the candidate. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to, if you've got any more specific questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, maybe, maybe in terms of um, when you're writing one, do you get in, like, did you ask for input from your previous PI or from peers? Or did you kind of do this all on your own and then do the best it could? Or did you try to get feedback from multiple sources? Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to get feedback. It's critical. There's, um, <laughs> they, because I mean, what you need is someone who's going to treat your grant like a review or treat it. And you need to get that feedback ahead of time so you know what the reviewers are going to say. Um, and it's quite possible because you'll, you'll find as your grants get reviewed, um, the simil similar comments come up again and again from reviewers. And when something's come up by all from all three reviewers, you really should kick yourself because if, you'd, if someone else had looked at your grant and given you that critical feedback, you could address that much more successfully than you can in your typical two-page response to reviewer um, documents. So putting your grant applications through a really rigorous peer review process before you submit it, I think is really, really critical. Um, I was also really helped by someone who specializes in, um, in PR and marketing. Um, because remember, writing grant is essentially a, a PR exercise. You're, you're trying to sell something. And so having someone who's got that particular expertise um, and who can, who can basically just help you, someone who's, they won't be an expert, but they'll be able to s suggest ways of crystallizing your idea a bit better or helping you see what's really, really important to emphasize. Um, these people are experts at basically standing in other people's shoes and imagining how it would be read by, 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 by a particular type of person. And, and that's what you need when you're coming to grant because you want someone who can stand in the shoes of a, of a busy peer reviewer or a, um, a panelist, panel member who's already looked at 10 grants that day um, and really just wants to take home message very quickly. Um, someone who's good at that is, is really helpful for writing these grants. Thanks, John. That was uh, super helpful, I guess, uh, for lots of people. Uh, we'd like to change gear a bit and um, talk, talk about your maybe more personal, asking maybe personal questions. Um, so how are your working hours? How are you managing your free time um, with family, especially during the pandemic? Um, did you need to readapt your working hours, your free time, and of course everything? Um, both for the pandemic and also before the pandemic, and how are you envisioning uh, this will affect later on when hopefully uh, soon enough we'll be back in the lab uh, with normal masks and social distance, dis yeah. distancing, etc. Yeah, um, yeah, really, really good questions. Um, so I'm definitely not a success in this area. I mean, the pandemic was super hard. I've got two um, kids at primary school age and 
for the first lockdown in the UK, um, the um, their school shut completely and homeschooling fell on our shoulders. Um, and we, we were really, really amazing at it for, I think, the first week. <laughs> And then they kind of ran feral after that. So, um, but but it was really it was a really stressful time. Um, and I think as a family, as my wife and I, it was difficult for us. And we found ourselves kind of bickering about how much time relative to each other we're getting to work and that kind of thing. Um, so it was tough. Over the time, I think we managed to make it work better um and really that's and then second lockdown i think we we felt that it worked a lot better the school provision was better for a start um but anyway the general theme in this area i find is it's kind of constant course correction you're um, you're swinging one way and then the other and then one way and the other um and you um and i've and i've never really worked out a happy medium between working too hard not um, and, and, and neglecting family life and vice versa. Um, so yeah, we kind of muddle through. I wouldn't say, I think, I think it's probably the same for everyone there. It's quite a difficult challenge balancing these things. For me, I, I love work. I really enjoy it. So it, it doesn't ever feel like I'm, um, um, well, I, ne I never really feel that bored. I mean, there's loads of boring tasks you've got to do, but there's enough stuff to keep you interested to make you want to get the boring things out of the way so you can get onto the interesting and fun things. Um, and so my, I think the danger for me is just to become completely obsessed with work and to neglect those people in my life which are most important. And so I think that's really where the main course correction is I have to make um, in the way I approach work and family life. Um, yeah. Um, and before the pandemic and stuff, so if you have two kids, how did you manage uh, traveling abroad for conferences and these kind of things? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I, that's something I really enjoy doing. So, um, but I, I saw I would limit myself to um, the, the most important conferences I need to go to each year. I'll be really interested to see how the conference is going to change after this. Um, I don't think really the that aspect of travel is replaceable. I think there is something very important about being in the same room as people, having these um, serendipitous conversations and encounters around dinner tables um, that you can't, I don't think, really substitute for through a, a meeting. But I think I'll be able to attend more stuff because because things will be more available online as well. So I'll still make sure I get to the two or three main conferences I need to each year. I'll still travel for collaborations because I think it's it's really good to meet people. But maybe as well I'll be able to attend some additional things online. Thanks, John. And um, I have another question. I think just stepping back. Uh, maybe before closing out, if Julia has a further question, I wanted to ask you if you have any advice you would give to your past self, like your past PhD or your past postdoc, what would you say to him uh, now? Yeah, good question. Well, there's definitely been some dead ends <laughs> that I would ward away from. Um, but would I? Well, I mean, you do yeah there's a lot of there's obviously a lot of wasted time in research um and you end up pursuing ideas that really don't end up going anywhere particularly interesting you invest a lot of hope and energy in particular things which turn out okay but nowhere near as spectacular as you thought they might initially um but whether I'd advised, whether I'd want to intervene too much in my past life, I'm not sure, because you do also learn lots through those experiences. And really, there's no substitute for those, um, for, for what you, you experience and learn through those dead ends. Um, and then I think it, part of becoming a mature researcher is learning how to um, 
not get too carried away with particular hopes and dreams you have about your ideas, um, being a bit more circumspect, learning to um, not put all your eggs in one basket, but um, try lots of diff have have a few different um, ideas running, um, just in case some of them don't don't work out. Um, and all of those things, I think I've learned through the, the bad experiences. And I don't think if I'd have um, told my past self um, not to do this or not to do that, I'd have probably listened to them either. <laughs> That's a very nice way of putting up. Um, so like, even though there's things that won't work well, at least you learn from it. And I think that's a good yeah, way. Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. And kind of uh, the last question, um, how did you get into science or did you have like one Eureka moment when you were a kid or would you were you inspired by somebody in your early like childhood, let's say, and yeah. then further down after you studied biology, like what told you, OK, let's go into research rather than mm. another path? Yeah, um, I mean, I loved uh, nature when I was young. I used to be really fascinated by the natural world. There's some very early video footage of me as a seven year old telling um, the world that I wanted to be a naturist, <laughs> which uh, my wife brings out every now and again at, at dinner parties. Um, but um, yeah, so I was always, always interested in that. I read widely, I used to like bird watching and those kind of things. And so that's why I chose biology. Um, and really throughout my career, I've just followed what I've become interested in. Um, so I found during my biology degree, it was stem cells and regenerative medicine that really captured my imagination. Um, and so I looked for PhD opportunities to work in, in that area. And yeah, and, and so that, I think that's, that's really been my guiding light. What, what do I find interesting, exciting? Uh, what do I want to find out more about? And that's directed my that's directed my reading as well. I think generally, I I enjoy reading, but really when I study hard, it's because I've got a question that's niggling me, or there's something particular I want to I want to find out and look for and try and understand. Um, and so that kind of curiosity drive, I think, is what's kind of led me to to the point I am at the moment. And any particular person throughout your career that you could yeah, say? Well, I've talked uh, mainly about Richard Arefo, um, and he's been extremely significant for me, not just because he's paid me for a whole chunk of my career, <laughs> but also uh, because he's modelled extremely well how to, how to provide a supportive environment that allows people to pursue their interests to develop themselves as researchers and um, I think that's really one of his great skills is he's an outstanding manager um, and he's really good at bringing the best out of people and I think that's probably the most important skill you can have as a team leader because it means that um, you're, 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 the, the, you, you generally employ people who are motivated and um, are interesting people and they've got their own particular research interests and, and desires and, and trying to harness that and make sure it reaches the and, and you facilitate the, that, their development so that they're able to reach the potential. That's the way a successful research group works and grows because that's how good research happens when talented people um, invest their energy and able to, to and have what they need to, um, to do really good science. Uh, so I think probably I would, yeah, I would credit um, Richard because he did that for me as well. And that's really um, what, I'm, what I try and do in my own research group too. Thank you, John. And uh, to close up, we will both like to thank you. Uh, we're sure that your answers will be, um, will be heard from many by many researchers out there and hopefully they will find it interesting and useful. Cool. All right, thanks. For us. Thanks, thanks so much for asking me. It's really nice to chat to you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.